It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Gautam Malkani. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, Gautam has also been um, advising us in terms of the marathon uh, for kind of all kinds of other disciplines, uh, such as economy and uh, media. And I was somehow wondering, um, because you have uh, actually been working for the Financial Times, at the same time uh, writing a novel, and I was somehow uh, wondering if you could tell us a little bit about these two practices and um, uh, how all of a sudden this uh, first book you wrote kind of happened. Well, the, um, I think the hardest thing uh, when it came to sort of doing the day job at the Financial Times and then writing this novel uh, was switching between the language because the language I use for the Financial Times is, well, it's kind of pretty straightforward. And, uh, but the language in the book is this kind of mixture of hip-hop slang and Punjabi slang and, and, uh, and American slang. So it was very difficult to sort of write straight during the day and then come home in the evening and, and, and completely switch. But it, at the same time, it was, there was, it was quite useful because I was covering, as you said, I was covering the media industry. And um, one of the things I tried to do with the novel was to show the extent to which, you know, the characters in the book, the, the boys in the sort of London rude boy scene, which I was writing about, are in a sense kind of media product, con constructs of the media. They're kind of, they're almost like, instead of sort of your usual three-dimensional kind of characters, I wanted to have two-dimensional characters whose personalities were kind of projected onto them from, by the media, Bollywood, Hollywood. MTV, advertising for designer fashion brands, that, that kind of thing. So that's how it, the, the two inter interplay. And you told us that actually um, in a previous conversation we had that the title came before the book. So uh, maybe it's interesting to hear how London Stanley kind of as a title was almost a sort of a trigger or a generator of your, of your novel. Yeah, no, well, when I, L London Stanley was, yeah, London Stanley as a term, um, it was a term that I heard when I was doing the research. Many, I mean, the research goes back many years ago because it started off as a, an undergraduate dissertation. Um, I heard a couple of kids refer to themselves as London Starnies, and, and that kind of struck me because it, it wasn't a very widespread term, not like rude boy or dissy or any of the other kind of self-referential terms that, that kids had. But... What, what struck me about it was that it was such a kind of celebratory term. These, ki these guys were proud to be British, they were proud to be Asian, and they were proud to be Londoners. And so I kind of, so the word stuck in my mind and I decided that whether I wrote the book up as non-fiction or fiction or whatever, that I would call it London Stani. Of course, after the bombings of July last year, um, the word London Stani, or, or more, more, li more likely the word Londonistan and variations of that, sort of took on a more negative, uh, more negative connotations, but I, I was still keen that, you know, when I first heard the word, it was a positive term. It said something positive about London's multiculturalism, so I was very stubborn about sticking with it, even though, and not letting it be hijacked by that other kind of anti-multiculturalism agenda. What were the inspirations for you when you wrote the novel? What kind of uh, were authors who inspired you? Um, well, I was trying to write something that would, um, would get people reading who wouldn't normally read. So I was thinking about writers that I read, writers that basically when I was growing up that sort of pulled me away from my Nintendo. And, and so rather than kind of big name novelists, I was thinking about the writers that I, I read when I was a teenager. So S.E. Hinton, who wrote Rumblefish and The Outsiders, was really important in that respect. Um, I think that was probably the main influence. I mean, there's this other writer in America called Juno Diaz who wrote a collection of short stories called Drown. And what, ins what, what was great about that book and, what, and the reason it was so inspiring was the way it just kind of... It, 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 it examined race and identity and all those big issues, but in a really kind of subtle way. It wasn't so in your, it wasn't so in your face, so that was big. And then I, I, I'm a big fan... I mean, I guess I get influenced by everyone I read, but I'm a big fan of the, the American kind of writers, Brett, Brett Easton Ellis and, and Chuck Polonek, so they were really important as well. Brendan, do you have questions? Uh, not yet. No. 
Well, maybe I have a question. Um, you, you write for the Financial Times and you write a novel. Yeah. And, and those are at least two different worlds or two different genres. Uh, but they both have economic aspects. <coughs> and according to rumor, you have been kind of very successful as a novelist uh, in terms of the economy of your first book. <laughs> uh, That's been exaggerated, uh, but yeah. Can, can you talk about that? Because, because uh, I think we, we are really trying to see, you know, how money and how the potential connection to the market is affecting uh, a number of domains, including writing, art, etc. And uh, if you're referring to the sort of money that I got for the for the manuscript, is that is that right? Uh, yeah, um, I am. Um, no, I mean, I'm not asking you to explain anything. Sure. I, well, I think that I... But let's say, did your expertise in one world help you in the other world? Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. I'm misunderstanding the question. Um, yeah. No, what I wanted to do was, because I was looking at this sort of urban youth culture. I mean, the, 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 the South Asian, British, uh, Desi, rude boy scene is very much a part of the broader urban youth culture which encompasses things like R&B and hip hop and, and other things. And I did want to look at the, um, I wanted to look at the role of money, the role of um, hyper materialism in urban youth culture mm. and how that relates to the wider economy, absolutely. And how that, because it's tr it seems to me that insofar as this is a youth subculture, we've had, a, we've had youth subcultures before, but this is, this seems to me that the first one that, rather than being a counterculture, rather than sort of setting itself up in opposition to global capitalism and kind of corporate life, urban youth culture kind of promotes it, accentuates it, and uh, glorifies it. So I, I was keen to explore the, the implications of this with the book, that you know, this is, this is a subculture that, that worships affluence um, that's becoming mainstream culture. I mean, if you look at record sales, it's, it, you know, urban music now outsells rock. So I think there are important, and, and what I discuss in the book are these kind of, or the characters in the book, because it is a novel. Um, what I look at is the, the implications for inflation and just general assumptions about economic life, because you, you know, this, like, as I said, you know, we, young people are traditionally you know, it's, it's the kind of faded jeans look, but now it's kind of Versace jeans. And it's all, it's very, you know, it's very, it just struck me as something that had been overlooked. I mean, in the, in the book, the characters call it bling bling economics. And, and, and it's just this idea that we really don't have a good handle on inflation in a world where worshipping affluence is not just a niche thing. It's becoming mainstream for a lot of, for a lot of kids coming up through schools nowadays. We, and it's not just... It's not just an ethnic thing, although in the book I look at the ethnic side, I and mean, we've got the kind of chav phenomena uh, in, 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 in Britain. So, so that's kind of where I used, you know, my, my kind of geeky fascination with economics at the FT in the book. Speaking some months ago to actually in a fax interview with JG Ballard, I asked him about the future of the city. Uh, he talked a lot about surveillance, something we've also explored here through Team Newborn, and he talked about uh, London becoming a kind of an Orwellian nightmare disguised as a public service. But he also talked about um, sort of forms of early 21st century cities, something Scott Lash also hinted at, uh, such as unrestricted urban sprawl, decentered metropolis, transient agricultural, gated communities, and um, absence of traditional civic pride, all of that quote from J.G. Ballard. But I'm wondering how you would see the future of the city of London. Would well, you be more optimistic? Or what would yeah, be your well, I, um, well, there's two things that kind of immediately come to mind. I'm, I'm sure I could, I could think of other things, but the two things that immediately come to mind is there is this sort of, insofar as uh, I've been researching and, and kind of writing about the kind of anti-assimilation ethic, the anti-integration ethic. One of the one of the the, the, the the forms that that takes that I've noticed when interviewing kids and, and, and uh, um, is a kind of th there's this lack of um, 
kids don't subscribe to public services, they don't want to take public transport, I think that's a very important thing that people don't realize. And again, it's part of this sort of bling bling economics thing. This worship of affluence means kids want their own cars. Uh, and, and so, you know, but not put, subscribing to the public transport network, public health system, the public, you know, the education system, I feel that that's kind of, that's quite a, a pessimistic thing. And, and the, more, the more people I interviewed, the more worried I got about that. Um, because obviously, cities don't work without infrastructures and infrastructures don't work without some sort of um, subscription to them and the form and, and one of the kind of symbols for for the anti-assimilation ethic in the book is is the fact that these boys their parents are avoiding taxes I mean this whole idea of tax avoidance amongst people is, is kind of quite big so that so you know that's the kind of negative thing and that's concerned with sort of public finances infrastructure the idea of the system becoming uh, being seen as an enemy that people don't subscribe to, and that's again, I, I, in the book, I kind of focus on that as a sort of you know a very kind of British Asian Desi rude boy phenomena. But I'm not sure that it's restricted to race. On the more optimistic front, and this is about race because it's kind of what, what what I was researching and thinking about. Um, what I think. What I think has been good about London is London's always been a hotbed of youth subcultures, you know, from punk, goths, you know, we've always, it's been a great place for subcultures to thrive. And what I think we've seen amongst British Asian kids is that anti-assimilation, very assertive ethnic identity that I try and capture in the book, sort of morph into um, a subcultural identity. And that's very much you know, in the British tradition, it's a it's a British subculture, absolutely, yeah. And that that's the thing about it. It's, it, it, it it wasn't it was an anti it was a it was a kind of it was caught up in this kind of voluntary segregation that we had at school. And I recall, I um, mean, you know, all my mates were kind of subscribing to it at school. But suddenly, almost by retreating in, this section of the community has kind of developed a subculture, and fused the kind of aggressive gangster rap and bungra music with with more kind of less aggressive styles, uh, drum and bass, UK garage and, 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 and things like that. And basically you have this kind of DC subculture, this DC beat subculture. And I think that that's the way, that's the kind of channel through which the kids in the book reintegrate with mainstream society and, and kind of then kind of develop a kind of affiliation with mainstream society because the subcultural identity, as you said, it's it's, it's as British as it is Asian, it, it, and, and it kind of gives kids, when I, talk, when I was doing the interviews for the book, I was struck by the extent to which boys felt really, boys who, you know, if you look at them, you think this is a kind of anti-assimilation kind of thing that people are very worried about, but when you talk to them about their culture, their subculture, they were so proud of the way that it had been appropriated by the British mainstream media, by the BBC, you know, the BBC has really embraced this kind of subculture. And um, so, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of the, the, the optimistic and the pessimistic way of looking at it. What role uh, did interviews play when you wrote the book? Because you, you referred on several occasions that you made interviews with these kids whilst yeah. writing the book. Can you tell us how, how that worked? Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, the book just started off as an undergraduate dissertation. So I was always gonna, so um, the problem the problem with the undergraduate dissertation was it was only 20,000 words and I got so into it, in fact it was probably the only decent thing I did at university, that I over-researched it. So I, I left uni with all these tapes of interviews that I'd done with kids, not just boys, not just kind of aggressive rude boys, but also British Asian girls about this scene, about this identity. And I just, I just had, I had so many cassettes that when it came to writing it up as a novel, it was, it was a great resource to have because I, you know, I, I had the issues, I had the anecdotes, but and I also had the language to sort of really, really kind of immerse myself in. So whilst at that university when I did the research, I was kind of feeling a bit stupid for having over-researched the thing and done maybe, you know, a ridiculous number of interviews, m m many, many more interviews than I needed to have done. I don't know if it's as many as you guys are doing over there. <laughs> but, um, when it came to trying to capture this thing in a novel, I was, I was so grateful that I had all that cassette, so, yeah. Many, many thanks.